All right, let's get on the way. Um, today's webinar titled How to Accurately Estimate Mineral Resources by Considering Geological Structures. My name is David Barry, Senior Geostatistician for Geovariances Perth Office. Uh, Geovariances Perth Office is now part of the Data Mine Office. A um, couple of housekeeping notes. Presentation should last about half an hour. Um, you have a little question section in the GoToWebinar interface where you can ask questions either during the presentation or at the Q&A section at the end. Um, I'll answer them at the end of the webinar and you'll be emailed a copy, uh, or emailed a video link uh, for the webinar sometime in the 24 hours following the presentation. So if you're not here, it uh, means you've already received that and you're watching the recording. You'll all be on mute um, and so any communication with me will be via the, uh, the questions interface. Okay, so what are we talking about? Um, we're doing resource estimation, uh, geostatistics, and when we do this, we assume stationarity. So we're assuming that things are somehow statistically the same throughout our domain. And in particular, uh, we're going to assume that the, um, that the direction of anisotropy is the same. So if there's a principal direction of continuity, uh, it's going to be the same throughout our domain. Uh, but that's not always a realistic assumption. Um, we could have all sorts of complex geological structures. And um, if we make a simple stationarity assumption to assume that it's always constant, uh, we're not going to reproduce all of that complexity in our estimates. And uh, that means our estimates won't be very good. Uh, it's not what we want. So what can we do about this? Um, we want to account for deformation, follow the spatial correlation uh, where it leads. And in sedimentary environments, uh, there's a natural geological interpretation to, uh, to what's going on. At the time of deposition, uh, we'll assume that it was all horizontal. Um, but over time that uh, the rock got deformed and so we get these you know, varying directions, but there's still a clear layered uh, sense to what's going on. So what we'd like to do is get back to a flat horizontal domain and, and work with that. Then we can assume that, okay, everything is going horizontally and vertically and the, the stationarity assumptions should be more realistic. Uh, in magmatic environments, we've got the uh, shape of mineralizations resulting from diagenesis is influenced by existing tectonic deformations. Now, I will make a confession here. My background is in maths and physics. I'm not a geologist, and I don't really know what all of those words mean. But you might well be a geologist, and you should be nodding your head at these words and thinking, yes, uh, if we want to do a good job of modeling uh, the grades inside this kind of ore body, uh, we need to account for the shape of these deformations. How might we do that? Well, we have a couple of choices. Um, the first one is unfolding. So the idea is we deform the space, the you know, the world space that we have today, where it's all you know bended, and we move all of the points around so that we end up with something that's flat hopefully restoring what we had at the time of deposition millions of years ago. And then you do all of your geostatistical work in this nice, easy to work with flat grid. And then once you've finished with that, and you've done all your estimations there, you uh, move it all back, redeform it uh, so that we get a rep, uh, an estimate of what's in the ground in the present day. A comment is it, this is well suited to sedimentary deposits. The other option is local geostatistics. This goes by different names in different software packages. You might have heard it as local anisotropy, locally varying anisotropy, dynamic anisotropy. Uh, we're going to be uh, working in the, you know, the real world grid that we have today, 
but uh, when it comes to estimation, we're going to be reorienting our search ellipsoid um, at different points in the model. And the hope is that if we get our reorientations correct, uh, then our estimates will follow the shape of, uh, of the domain appropriately. Now, there are various methods to do the unfolding. Uh, the goal is we have something that's you know, not flat and we end up with something that is flat. Uh, Isatis Neo has three different options. Uh, the bend method is the most sophisticated and if you've got a very uh, overturned domain, uh, that'll be the option you'll need. Um, we also have projection and vertical shift, which uh, probably faster, but assume simpler um, amounts of folding. So if something is uh, like overturned, goes past the vertical, uh, these methods won't work, whereas the bend method may work. And the hope is that uh, if this unfolding works and we can restore what uh, we had at the time of deposition, uh, then uh, working with that, we should see a lot more continuity uh, horizontally and vertically um, in the in the grades. And so that should give us a better idea. You know, the variogram should be uh, clearer, uh, easier to interpret, and the estimates should go much more closely. Um, you should follow much more closely where the where the grades are going, because uh, the search ellipsoids will be exactly parallel to uh, what the environment was like you know, billions of years ago, uh, rather than mixing up things across the different layers, if you uh, naively assume stationarity uh, in, in what the deposit looks like today. For the local anisotropies, um, this little diagram here is representing what's going on. At different parts of the domain, we're just going to reorient the search ellipsoid. And if we do that in such a way that it follows the correct orientations, then uh, that should do a good job of ensuring that the estimates at each location uh, roughly follow the direction of continuity in that location. The creaking weights or simulation conditions will be modified accordingly. Um, so we, can, we we only work with the original grid in, in world space. We're not deforming it and creating a new grid as we would with unfolding. Uh, but we're hoping that the uh, by changing the orientations of the ellipsoids, we can restore the deformations. And there should be a, a better fit between what we're doing in our geos geostatistical model and what the real world, uh, how the real world is actually behaving. Uh, how might we do that? Uh, there are various techniques. Um, the one that's available with a point and click interface in our software is based on surfaces. So you can enter either one reference surface or a top and bottom surface. Uh, and it basically for each block in the block model, it will look to the nearest triangle in that surface. The triangle will define a strike and a dip and it will orient the search ellipsoid so the major axis is along strike and the semi-major axis is down dip. Now you may want to customize that further uh, and because a triangle only gives you two angles and the rotation is defined by three angles so you may have to go into the uh, to the Python calculator and set the third angle appropriately. That's the way our uh, local anisotropy by surface tool works. Um, there are various other techniques described in the literature, um, some gradient based techniques. We don't have an interface for that, but it is possible to calculate these uh, with the Python calculator. Now, in all of what I've been saying, I've been talking about orientations and changing rotations and so forth. Local geostatistics is actually a little bit more general than that. You can also change properties of your variogram model. You can change the ranges and the sills. Um, how to set those factors, that's more complicated. We will have a tool coming out. Uh, in fact, it may already be out. Um, the last couple of days, we've got the version 2023.08. 
uh, using some cross validation to try you know, how should the variogram model parameters vary at different parts of your domain based on the samples that are around it. I don't think that's uh, too commonly applied though, and I'm going to focus all of my demonstration just on the orientations and the ellipsoids. So I've got two methods here. Uh, what are the pros and cons of them? Well, for the unfolding, um, it's a very flexible, very general approach. And uh, the search neighborhoods will more closely follow the anisotropy. Um, one problem with, the, uh, with just changing the orientations of the ellipsoids is that each ellipsoid is still just a, an ellipsoid with you know, one major axis, one semi-major, one minor. Uh, they don't follow the, the folding that exists in the geology. So we can approximate that a little bit, like it's better than doing nothing. It's not as successful as, uh, as a search ellipsoid in unfolded space would be. So if you can succeed in getting the unfolding to work, um, my feeling is the results will generally be more satisfactory. Some difficulties, um, you can certainly get artifacts with complex geometries. I'm not gonna promise that it will definitely work the first time. Uh, it can be difficult to get it to, to go. Um, issues with change of support. Um, there's an issue if you have a block in the real world, that block shape would be distorted by the unfolding. And we don't really, um, you know, handle that and say we have this really complicated, I don't know, parallelogram or something. Um, so doing a change of support, going from points to blocks, and probably discretizing a very fine point grid, doing point estimates and then re-blocking back in world space. Um, or you're just uh, keeping the orientation and size of the block the same as it is in the world space and just accepting that, okay, we've unfolded the location of the block, we're not really modeling the shape of the block properly in, un in, in unfolded space. And generally it is a little bit of a time consuming, more disk space consuming uh, approach. The local geosats, you know, dynamic anisotropy, um, allows following the, uh, the deformations that we have Sometimes you can't do the unfolding, that just the process doesn't work, the surfaces are too complicated, um, and the local geostats. If you're able to define a local uh, direction of continuity, then you can use it. You don't have to go through the flattening process, which may be difficult. You don't have to create a new unfolded grid and have two different grids and you know figure out how to send data back and forth between them. If you've got more than one domain, you know, you could have many different unfolded grids. It's a little bit more difficult to keep track of. You can do change of support either by discretization or with um, discrete Gaussian model. Maybe we're cheating the, a little bit with the discrete Gaussian model, not strictly correct if, uh, if we're varying the orientation of our variogram model, but you can do it and it might be the, uh, the least bad efficient way to get results. Uh, you can't really manage faults with it though. Um, if you're doing simulations, you can do locally varying anisotropies with sequential Gaussian simulation and uh, SPDE, the stochastic partial differential equations. You can't use it with turning bands. Uh, the turning band simulation, which is the most efficient uh, uh, technique we have available in our software, uh, just isn't compatible with local anisotropy. The bands have to extend an infinite amount in each direction. And the search ellipsoids don't follow the bends that you might have in the, um, uh, in the geology. So if the search ellipsoid size is large compared to the scale at which this thing is folding over, uh, then the ellipsoids might be, you know, varying their, uh, their orientation might be better than nothing. They don't follow it as well as the unfolded data would. So, now it's time to jump into the software and show a little synthetic data to illustrate uh, these concepts. So here I have some drill holes, have a couple of surfaces, bottom and top, and you can see these are defining a fairly narrow slice of this data set. And if I 
just select the points that are in between the surfaces. We can see there's not a lot of samples in here. This isn't going to be a super high quality estimate. Um, there's also almost no samples at all over in this uh, southwestern corner of the uh, of the domain. Uh, but we will still be able to go through the process and uh, and see how successful these results are. So I've got a batch file here which serves a dual purpose today. It shows off the ability of Azardis Neo to record tasks and for you to then rerun them. And it also means that I don't have to uh, set all the parameters myself manually during a live presentation and probably make mistakes and get wrong results. Let's look at the local anisotropies first. Um, the way this works, we set either one or two surfaces. Um, I could set top and bottom, but like, to be honest, they're both pretty close to parallel, so it's not going to make much difference either way. Uh, we can set a smoothing. So as I was saying, the, the way this works is it looks for each centroid of a block in the block model, it looks for the nearest triangle that defines a strike and a dip. Uh, we can do a bit of smoothing. Um, we can increase the amount of smoothing uh, as, as, as uh, illustrated in this diagram. Output is this two by two by two block model. This is a pretty small set of blocks given that the drill spacing is about 20 by 20 or thereabouts. So we maybe think of these as, um, as discretized points. And I think I can run this one live and it only takes a couple of seconds. We've got about, um, as I recall, 80,000 or 90,000 blocks um, in this domain. And the output here is a rotation. Um, if I were to make a new one, I can change the convention, uh, geologist plane or the data mine ZXZ, uh, the, my preferred ones. Uh, if I do want to do further manipulation of this rotation object, I probably don't want to be working as a mathematician, despite my background as a mathematician. I would prefer to work with a geologist plane. The third angle is just a little bit easier to interpret. So that gives us a rotation variable in the block model. Uh, the workflow to use this, well, we have to uh, define a variogram model. So on the composites, the selection, I've store this in the batch file. So I've already got the um, the parameters preset here. As I, as I said, there's only 100 or so samples in this domain. The variography is not going to be of high quality. I've just set one regular direction uh, in the reference plane. So that's a horizontal direction and a vertical direction. And by having the range horizontally be quite a lot larger than the range vertically, you should be able to see the um, how well the locally varying anisotropy is able to reproduce this kind of behavior where we expect more continuity as we follow the directions of the surfaces and more variability when we go perpendicular. So in the workflow you'd click the save button once you're happy with the variogram model and uh, save that to a geostatistical set. And then you open the Krieging task you set that geostatistical set as your input. We'll read what variable you were, you, you've uh, modeled that variogram with. Choose the output block model. Selection to say which blocks you want to uh, estimate. Um, in most applications, you'd be doing block creaking but to make this run faster. And because these are really tiny blocks, doing point creaking. And the important point is that you need to check this box, use local anisotropies. And when you check that, you click next. Uh, you get the uh, the options of what sort of local anisotropies or local geostats you wish to set. Typically, your rotation will be defined on the same grid that you're estimating. You can have it on another grid and it'll do some interpolation. Uh, the main choices here are going to be using a local rotation for your variogram model and for your search ellipsoid. You can set only one or the other. But usually, I think you would set both. The other options more rarely used if you want to change the sills or change the ranges, uh, you can check those boxes. But we, uh, 
not so commonly used. I click next. Uh, we go to the neighborhood definition page. And if I press apply, it will, this neighborhood definition page does a sort of like a test Krieging on one slice of the grid. Um, and see, this is sort of intersecting two parts of our little domain. And if I click the, the picker icon here and click on different parts of this, I can see that the search ellipsoid is changing its uh, orientation. You see, sometimes it's a really big ellipsoid and sometimes it's really small. It's because I've got nested neighborhood on here. So if it, my first search is 70 meters horizontally and 15 meters vertically, rotated according to my uh, uh, rotations. Uh, if, there, if it can't find enough samples within that first search, then it will do a second pass, doubling the size, and if not, then a third pass. Um, if I change the section content from the Creed estimate to the neighborhood index, see the colors here. Green is the standard neighborhood. So if I click on one of the green blocks, it's a small ellipsoid. If I click on one of the yellow ones, it becomes much larger. There are some orange ones here for an enormous one. There's like, this, is, this block is a long way from samples. Next. Now, in general, you could output lots of variables here, Creek efficiency, slope of regression, and so on. This is just a quick demo. It's going to output the Creek estimate itself. 83,000 blocks estimated. And so the question is, how well does this estimate follow the anisotropy? I'm going to go to my section view here and turn on the block model, this one. And it does a pretty good job. You can see the high grades here in red, generally following this and sort of following it around, maybe not perfectly, but doing a pretty good job. Over here, the direction of continuity is closer to vertical. Uh, so, you know, decent success, like anisotropy is working. It's not the only option we have in this case. We can try the unfolding. Now, as I was saying, I'm not going to guarantee if you try this that it's going to work perfectly the first time. There are quite a number of options here. We've got three choices on the method that we use. For the complicated surfaces, you will need the bend method. It's overturned it. All these other ones won't work at all. Uh, so I've chosen the bend method because if I go back to my main 3D view. Uh, this is you know, probably too complicated for the projection. I didn't actually test, but it's probably need the bend method. Um, you can ask to have the output domain be of a constant thickness, up to you whether that's geologically relevant or not. It's uh, chosen here. And there are some advanced parameters, which if, uh, if you feel like it's sort of half working, but not really satisfactory, maybe you go in here and you try increasing or decreasing the number of points that it uses to help control the unfolding. Um, don't have any general tips there. Uh, geology can be very complicated and uh, don't have a general rule. We'll continue to try to make this as easy as possible, but unfortunately the real world does pose some difficult challenges to us sometimes. So we say we want to unfold a block model and we also want to unfold our input data and it'll create a new folder and various files inside that with our unfolded data sets. This one I won't run live. It doesn't take too long, but uh, last time I ran one of these like moderately hard calculations in a live presentation, it, the CPU resources got all sucked up and my audio cut out for a minute and no one could hear what I was saying. So I'll just use the, um, the unfolded data that I created earlier and See, now it's all flat. So that has successfully unfolded my samples up there and it's made it in constant thickness, just like I asked. Some of these uh, drill holes don't cover the full width of this domain and that would be because they don't, um, if I turn on the top, these, uh, the, these samples out here only just intersect the domain. They don't really fully cross it. So that's why most of these drill holes do go 
top to bottom in the unfolded space, but not all of them. And similarly, we have a unfolded block model in which we could uh, Krieg. So let's go back to my batch file. Um, first step to Krieging is generating the, uh, modeling the variogram. So back to EDA, and now we're in the unfolded space. In general, we would expect clearer uh, amounts of anisotropy in unfolded space compared to in the original space. This has only got 124 samples. I don't want to draw any general lessons from it. That's what's supposed to happen. Should see a uh, you know, bigger anisotropy ratio of your major to minor axes and so on. It saved that to a new geostatistical set. Go to Krieging, choose that as your main input. Choose the unfolded block model as the output now. Uh, we're not going to use local anisotropies. We're just going to use a, um, a constant search neighborhood aligned horizontally and vertically. So no rotations. You can run this. This one's super fast. I get my 83,000 blocks estimated. And then the key point is that that estimate is living in unfolded space. But we need for any practical purpose to get it back to the real world. And to do that, we use the copy using ID e to uh, copy using ID tool, which is the data management. And we have the unfolding tool has created for us a world sample number that says, hey, this unfolded block that belongs to the corresponding sample number in the real world space. Set your output as the block model. It's a pretty quick process. Let's go back to our section view and change from our estimate from local anisotropies, the estimate from unfolding. You can see the unfolded uh, continuity here is very nicely following this bend all the way around. It does a more sophisticated job of following that geometry than simply changing the orientation of the ellipsoids. So generally speaking, if you can get the unfolding to work well, uh, then I think it will do better than the local anisotropies. And you could continue estimation validation and compare the results against the input data. Um, see there's something going on a little bit different uh, way out in the east, probably where there aren't any, um, aren't any samples. Plenty of uh, food for thought if you uh, get to that stage in the estimate and, and really want to understand what's going on, why are the two methods giving very slightly different results. A difference in the mean was very tiny. But they are different methods and as you go further away from your data points, you can expect some discrepancies. Um, so that's the end of the demo. So if you have questions, now would be a good time to uh, to ask them in the little questions section. And while you're thinking of questions to ask, I'll talk a little bit about geovariances. Uh, we're owned by Avela Software, part of the DataMine Group, global provider of geostatistics-based solutions, uh, pioneer in advanced geostats. The intellectual driving force of the company for decades now has been a technical partnership with the Center for Geostatistics in uh, the School of Mines in Paris, Ming Pai, founded in 1986, so several decades of experience. And we've got 40 plus technical experts, consultants, and developers in various offices around the world, the head office being in France. Got some upcoming training on offer, mineral resource estimation, recoverable resource estimation, drill hole spacing analysis, and machine learning from different offices around the world. We have various advanced uh, consulting and mentoring services on offer, uh, definition of geological and geomet domains using machine learning techniques, resource estimation and classification, uh, optimization, short, medium, long-term estimates, uh, uncertainty, drill spacing, optimization, recovery resources, automation, including building graphic interfaces, uh, R&D and mentoring. 
and I have timed that well. We just got a question and I'm gonna have to pop out my interface to read it. So uh, Marlies Barden asks, when using a local anisotropy method, what is the best process for your variography? Would using a subset of the data with a relatively constant uh, direction of you know, continuity be a good idea? Or would you use the entire domain's data for variography? My feeling is it would be better to use a subset. Um, try to get the cleanest direction of anisotropy, you know, with clean, uh, a, a part of the data where the direction of anisotropy is, is fairly consistent. And uh, okay, you're throwing away a lot of your data in that case, but it's a purer, cleaner data that should, uh, you know, the statistics from that should be more representative of what the um, sort of, what the original thing should be, how, what you should do, uh, or the estimate across the whole domain. Um, if you do use the whole data set in together, you're sort of mixing up your directions in the variogram calculations. And um, so, okay, you've got a bigger sample size, but you're jumbling up your, vari your anisotropy and then probably reducing the, um, the anisotropy ratios. Uh, Tatsuki asks, what do you think if we have, uh, if we're working in a high density stock work area. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to say I don't know on that one. Uh, my feeling is a stock work is usually more difficult to model. This is part, you know, part of my problem here is that I'm not a geologist. My understanding is a stock works are, have much more complicated uh, directions of you know, multiple directions of anisotropy in different places. Um, so if, if you feel that you're able to define them, then define these uh, orientations, then you know, it's probably better that you do that than not. But um, any answer I give here has to come with a huge caveat that I don't really know too much about that aspect of, uh, of this subject. And um, not too many questions today, just the two of them. Oh, we've got another one um, for lateritic nickel, uh, or laterite in general. Do you prefer LGS or unfolding? Um, I feel like usually the, the laterites, so you can define the layers quite well the unfolding should be quite successful there. So um, I would probably lean towards unfolding. Um, the difference is probably fairly minor. But I think generally my, my, my bias here is that if you can unfold, then the unfolding is a more sophisticated way to handle the, um, the varying anisotropy. So uh, I'd go with unfolding if you can. All right, and if there are no further questions, that'll be the end of the webinar. Um, when this ends, you'll get a little prompt uh, asking you to fill in an evaluation form. We'd certainly appreciate it if you do that. Uh, helps make our webinars more relevant to what you would like to, uh, to hear from us about. So thanks very much for attending. And, uh, oh, got a late question. Rule of thumb, how many generations of folding that can handle? I don't have a rule of thumb, sorry. Um, all I can say is try it and uh, you'll see if it works well or not. Um, All right. Um, hope to see you next time. Thanks for attending.